Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the first of our keynote uh, talks for the Elixir All Hands Meeting 2020. This year is a little bit different, of course. Uh, it's um, a virtual All Hands. So I'm Niklas Blomberg, the director of Elixir, and it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Janet Kelso, who's a group leader at uh, the Bioinformatics Research Group at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig in Germany. And Janet is, of course, one of the leading experts in the world in the bioinformatic analysis of the ancient genomes. So I'll briefly introduce Janet. She has a PhD from the University of uh, Western Cape. Uh, oh. And I think she'll be well known for her research in ancient genomes, but she's also been uh, really um, engaged and important in shaping the international bioinformatics community. She's been uh, uh, vice chair for the or vice president for the International Society for Computational Biology. She's also an ICSP fellow. She's a co-editor of the bioinformatics journal. And so I, I think uh, most of you will recognize her for all the community work that she's put a lot of effort into. And on the more personal note, we benefited tremendously in Elixir from Janet's uh, discussion and challenging questions and many good advice in her uh, role at the Elixir Scientific Advisory Board. So it's a real pleasure to have you here today, uh, Janet. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Thank you. It's really fun to be here. It's a different format to usual. Let me just get my screen sharing. There you go. Um, and I'm sorry we couldn't do this in person. It would have been fun to see everyone. But I hope that this will be just as much fun. Um, so what I want to do today is to talk with you or share with you some of the work that we've been doing generating and, and using genome sequences from archaic humans. And what I'm going to focus on in particular today are, are some of the ways in which it's been possible to use these genomes together with those of present day people to do two things. The first is to learn about the population histories of modern and archaic humans. And the second is to try and understand the genetic basis of human adaptation and susceptibility to, to disease, as well as the genetic basis of particularly interesting phenotypes. Okay. Good. Um, so it's widely accepted that modern humans, the group to which we all belong, emerged in Africa something like 200,000 years ago and expanded later into Eurasia perhaps sometime around 70 to 100,000 years ago. And at that time, Europe was not uninhabited. There were at least two other groups of humans living there. Um, many people know about the Neanderthals, our nearest extinct relatives, but also another group, the Denisovans, that I'll talk a little bit about later. And we know from the fossil record that Neanderthals occupied Europe and, and Western Asia from around 400,000 years ago until around 40,000 years ago. And we also know from the skeletal remains that they left behind that modern humans and Neanderthals show morphological differences. And we speculate based on differences in their geographic distribution and in the tools and the art that they left behind, that there were also behavioral differences between the two groups, perhaps cognitive differences. So given the timing of the arrival of modern humans in Eurasia, we know that modern humans and Neanderthals were contemporaneous in Eurasia for perhaps as much as 10 to 20,000 years. And it's sort of widely discussed that the, uh, the arrival of modern humans in Europe coincides roughly with the dis disappearance of the Neanderthals. Um, so as modern humans expand, the Neanderthals seem to disappear. And, and it's, it's a topic of quite some discussion and debate why that's the case. And I don't think that, ne that genetics can necessarily give us the answer to that. But prior to the availability of genetic data, the relationship of us as modern humans to the Neanderthals was not 100% clear. It wasn't totally clear whether they were our ancestors or whether they were a sister group. And it was a topic of some debate whether when we moved out, modern humans moved out of Africa and into Eurasia, whether we might have interacted or even interbred with the Neanderthals. So the very first DNA that was ever sequenced from a Neanderthal was sequenced in the late 1990s by T.S. Kring and Svante Pebo. And this pro provided just a few hundred bases of the mitochondrial genome. And it showed that at least mitochondrially, the Neanderthals are a distinct group, a separate clade from modern humans. Um, and what you see here is in the genomes of a number, number of Neanderthals. The first um, mitochondrial genome sequence was that of the type specimen, the Feldhofer Neanderthal. But subsequent sequencing of a number of Neanderthals has, has shown that this picture holds. Um, so from the mitochondrial genome, it was then speculated that a complete replacement of Neanderthals by modern humans leaving Africa was 
the most likely scenario that for, at least from the mitochondrial genomes it didn't seem that there had been any mixture between between the two groups but mitochondrial dna is just a single locus it's inherited only maternally and so it doesn't rule out that there might have been a small amount of interbreeding between the groups or some interbreeding between the groups but in order to resolve that what one needed were nuclear genomes from neanderthals and in the late 1990s, when the sequencing was done, large-scale nuclear genome sequencing of ancient specimens was simply not feasible. And that was due to two factors. The first is, was the limited throughput of sequencing technology. So I'm sure everyone here is aware of the fact that we've undergone a massive sequencing re revolution in the last 10 to 15 years. But in late 1990s, um, standard sequencing approaches simply weren't um, applicable to ancient DNA. Um, you needed to do PCR amplification. The molecules are generally very short. That's not, not easy to do. And then I th secondly, and I think more importantly, a number of characteristics of, of the DNA extracted from ancient specimens made direct sequencing very difficult, uh, uh, sequencing using ABI technologies very difficult. And I just want to talk a little bit about some of those features so you get the idea of the kind of data that we're dealing with. So to start with, the data, the, the sequences that we get from um, ancient materials like bones or teeth is highly degraded. It's typically fragmented into very short pieces. You see a length distribution here. This is one of the more reasonable specimens we have, where the average length of the fragments that we get, the molecules that we get out of the bone, are 40, 50, 60 nucleotides. Um, the DNA also accumulates specific patterns of chemical damage. And the, pa the pattern that's most characteristic of ancient DNA is the deamination of cytosine to, uh, to uracil. And while these, the presence of these um, urethral um, moieties is characteristic of ancient DNA and it can be very useful because it's a way to identify truly ancient molecules. It leads to massive um, challenges for, for alignment, for example, and for genotyping. And then finally, um, and perhaps most critically, most of the DNA that we get from a bone is not from the owner of that bone. It's from microbial contamination, uh, microorganisms that colonize the bone after the death of the individual. And you see here, um, this is actually a, um, a plot of the amount of Neanderthal DNA. So there's written as primate from the original Neanderthal that was sequenced, the first Neanderthal that was sequenced. And there we have about 3% of the DNA coming from the Neanderthal, the rest being largely microbial. Um, many of the specimens we have are, are even worse than that. That's actually not too bad a case. And so it was really only in around 2005 the advent of next generation sequencing that it became possible to extract and directly sequence ancient molecules in the quantities that are needed to reconstruct nuclear genomes from ancient humans and um, it doesn't work quite exactly like you see in the picture there um, it, the process typically starts with the removal of a small amount of powder from bone or from from a bone or from a tooth um, sort of on the on the order of fewer than 100 milligrams of bone powder from which dna is extracted and then sequencing libraries are prepared. Um, and those sequencing libraries are double indexed. And then they're either reamplified and sequenced directly, so shotgun sequenced, or they go through some kind of um, enrichment capture, which allows us to extract out sites of particular interest. And it's in this process here um, that many improvements, massive improvements in, in molecular methods over the past years have allowed us to optimize the yields of ancient DNA from ancient specimens. And you see up in the right, Matthias Meyer, whose group has worked extremely tirelessly on every step in this process um, to reduce contamination and to selectively retrieve molecules showing evidence of deamination and therefore enriching, uh, therefore allowing us to enrich for the ancient DNA that's actually in the specimens. This together, of course, with the, the development of computational methods that allow us to make sure that all the ancient molecules that Matthias's group puts so much effort into retrieving, we're actually able to analyze or include in our analysis. And so using these approaches, we have over the last 10 or so years sequenced to high coverage the genomes of three Neanderthals. The first is a Croatian Neanderthal, the, the so-called Vindia Neanderthal, which was the first um, nuclear genome to be sequenced. The individual is around 40 to 45,000 years old. Um, and then two Neanderthals from, um, from the Altai region of the Russian Caucasus. Um, first, a Neanderthal from Denisova Cave, um, one of the, uh, currently the oldest Neanderthal for which we have a nuclear genome. Um, it's older than 120,000 years old. And most recently, and actually um, just about to come out, 
I mean, publication, the genome of an individual from Chigirskaya Cave, which is just a valley across from Denisova. Um, this individual is something like, lived something like 80,000 years ago, um, very near to Denisova. And these genomes are sequenced to between 30 and 50 fold coverage. And so for the non-repetitive regions of those genomes that are mappable with short reads, we have a quality that's similar to that of, of modern genomes. And so we can do all the normal things you would do with a modern genome. We do genotyping and, and straight analysis. In addition, we've been able to sequence uh, to more modest coverage, partial coverage, the new nuclear genomes of more than 10 other Neanderthals that cover a good part of the temporal range of the Neanderthals, particularly here in Western Europe. So we have the Sladony Neanderthal, which is the oldest of these Western European Neanderthals at 120,000, and then Neanderthals ranging through time down to 40,000 year old individuals. Um, that sample then some of the, as I said, some of the temporal variation, but also some of the geographic variation. We have Neanderthals here from Mesmaiskaya in Russia too. And these genomes have provided us with a number of insights into the population history of the Neanderthals. So with very high coverage genomes, we're able to see both chromosomes. And this allows us to count the number of nucleotide sites that differ between the chromosome that the individual inherited from its mother and from its father. And if you do this in present day humans, and you can see the numbers here, if you do this in present day humans, you get between seven and 10 differences per 10,000 base pairs between the, the two chromosomes, depending on the ancestry of the individual. African individuals have a higher diversity, a higher heterozygosity than non-African individuals. In the Neanderthals, what we found is that there were substantially fewer differences, only about 1.8 differences per 10,000 nucleotides in these Neanderthals. So less than, less than a fifth of the heterozygosity seen in modern humans from Africa. And this is much, much lower than seen in any modern humans today. And it's among the lowest numbers reported for any organism to date. And part of the explanation for this is that we see very extended segments of homozygosity where both chromosomes are identical. And you can see here, um, I've highlighted the Neanderthals here for you, but you can see here that the Neanderthals have an excess of um, very long tracts of, of homozygosity, as well as intermediate tracts of homozygosity. And these very long tracts, they correspond to um, an individual whose parents were closely related to one another. Um, whereas this excess of intermediate length fragments suggests that Neanderthals lived in groups that were likely quite small over 100 or more generations. Um, leading to sort of long-term inbreeding among the Neanderthals. And new estimates from the Chigirskaya paper suggest that Neanderthals lived in groups on, on the order of 50 to 100 individuals. In addition, we've been able to look at the relationship between these Neanderthals who lived at quite different times and in different geographic locations. And what we see here is that the Chigirskaya Neanderthal, who's a Neanderthal, that, if I can remind you, from the Altai region and uh, that lived about 80,000 years ago, this Chigirskaya Neanderthal is genetically more similar to the Vindya, the much younger Vindya Neanderthal, around 40,000 40, years ago, um, than it is to the Altai Neanderthal, that's a little older, but that lives very nearby. And the reason for that appears to be, so once we have had lower coverage genomes, we could look at these lower coverage genomes and try and figure out who are they more closely related to, you know, what kind of populations were there. And these lower coverage genomes range in age from 120 to around 40,000 years ago, as I said. And we see that all these Neanderthals and the Chigirskaya individual, all, they sort of form a group. They're all more closely related to one another than any of them is to this Altai Neanderthal from Denisova Cave. And, and so what we've proposed is that this re reflects a major event in Neanderthal population history. Sometime after this individual, so sometime after 120, 130,000 years ago, there was a massive movement of Neanderthals from the west to the east, replacing Neanderthal populations completely in the east. And it will be interesting to, to think about what geographic or perhaps climatic conditions might have led to such a large scale replacement. I've talked a little bit about Denisova Cave. This is a cave in the Altai region. It's been a very important site for us for many of our studies. This cave has a very extensive stratigraphy, so many, many layers of long-term uh, evidence of occupation. There are many mammalian remains. We find uh, DNA from cave bears, bones from hyenas. And there are ongoing excavations at this site by a very active group that mean new, new material is continuing to continually being found. In 2010, we were sent this very small bone, which you see here, um, a finger bone that was found in Denisova Cave. 
And the genome that we obtained from that finger bone, expecting that it would either be modern human or Neanderthal, was neither modern human nor Neanderthal. And we were able to re reconstruct a high coverage nuclear genome from this individual to show that, and to show that it was a previously unknown archaic group that shares a common ancestor. So it's a sister group to Neanderthals. It shares a common ancestor with Neanderthals somewhere between, some, some, sometime between 350 and 500,000 years ago. And then they together, a common ancestor with modern humans between six and 700,000 years ago. And this group has been named the Denisovans after the site in which they're found. Um, and analyses of these, the genomes of these Denisovans suggest that Denisovans were rather more numerous than Neanderthals and, and, and also likely more widespread. So studies of, of um, mixture with, with Denisovans suggest that they were much more widespread than Neanderthals. The fossil remains of Denisovans are still very limited. Um, so far, they're identified only by DNA only from a handful of specimens. We don't know what they looked like because the, the extent of the fossil record is at, at present something like this, a few teeth, a couple of very small bone fragments. Um, and so, so this is at the moment what we have. Um, but excitingly, a mandible found last year in China might be the first evidence of, Denisova cave, of Denisovans outside of Denisova Cave. This mandible was found at a site, well, near, from, it comes from a site called Baixia Karst, which is on the Tibetan Plateau. Um, it's been estimated to be at least 160,000 years old. And unfortunately, no DNA could be extracted from this bone, but a small number of uh, bone peptide fragments could be extracted and were sequenced by mass spectrometry. And one of these peptides carries an amino acid a change that we know from comparison of the genomes is specific to Denisovans, and it's not seen in modern humans or Neanderthals, suggesting that this bone might well come from a Denisovan, and suggesting then that Denisovans might have lived at very high altitudes on the Tibetan Plateau as long ago as 160,000 years. Um, I think in coming years, this is going to be very exciting, determining more about the Denisovans and identifying additional Denisovans outside of Denisova Cave. One, strange inconsistency that we found in the sequencing of these ancient genomes is that if we look at the nuclear DNA, the nuclear genomes, um, then as I showed you before, Denisovans and Neanderthals are sister groups and modern humans are the art group, so to say. However, when we look at their mitochondrial genomes, um, the picture is different. Here, Neanderthals are closer to modern humans and Neanderthals and modern humans form a sister group and the Denisovans are outside. And this is quite puzzling, and only quite recently we have some evidence for what might be going on. And the first piece of evidence comes from the a tiny bit of the nuclear genome of one of the very oldest hominin forms in Europe. These are the individuals from the Cima de los Huesos, which is a site in Atapuerca in Spain, with the skeletal remains of um, uh, 28 individuals, 28 hominin individuals have been found. And these have, these have been estimated to be over 400 100,000 years old, and they were initially thought to perhaps be Homo heidelbergensis. However, Matthias Meyer um, and his methods group in our department have been able to retrieve tiny amounts of nuclear DNA that show that the SEMA individuals are in fact very early Neanderthals. So in their nuclear genomes, they look like Neanderthals, although quite early on the linea Neanderthal lineage. However, despite the fact that they're clearly early Neanderthals, when we looked at their mitochondrial genomes, they have mitochondrial genomes that look Denisovan-like. So this led us to speculate that what's going on is that the Denisovan and SEMA mitochondrial DNA type is the original mitochondrial DNA. It represents the original mitochondrial DNA carried by archaic humans. And that the mitochondrial genomes that we see in all later Neanderthals, those ones that look more similar to the, the mitochondrial DNAs of modern humans, are the result of gene flow from very early ancestors of modern humans that led to the replacement of the Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA in all the Neanderthals sometime after the SEMA individual, so after 400,000 years ago. Of course, what would be very interesting would be to look at the other non-recombining um, locus in the genome, the other non-recombining chromosome, and that's the paternally inherited Y chromosome. We might get some hints here about what's going on if we could see the Y chromosome of our KX. However, despite all this work, this 10 years of work and the growing set of archaic genome sequences that we've been able to generate, until very recently, we had a tiny, tiny, about 160 kilobases of coding sequence from the Y chromosome of just one Neanderthal. 
And this is because all the specimens that are well-preserved enough to be amenable to whole genome shotgun sequencing have so far been female. So the Vindia individual that I told you about, the Denisovan, individual, the Denisovan um, Neanderthal, and the Denisovan, um, as well as the, the Neanderthal from the, from the Russian Caucasus, from, from Chigirskaya, are all female. And so Matea Haidinjak, that you see in the top right-hand corner there, spent a long time systematically going through the collections and identifying potentially male specimens that could perhaps be suitable for YC, Y chromosome sequencing. And she managed to put together a set of three Neanderthals, um, a Neanderthal from Spi in Belgium, a Neanderthal from El Cidron in Spain, and one from Esmaiskaya in Russia, as well as two of the Denisovans, uh, noting here that these two Denisovans are quite different in age, a much older one and a younger one. And um, from these, we thought that there would be a possibility to get some sequence. But given the amount of microbial DNA possible in these specimens, shotgun sequencing was simply not feasible. And so Martin Peter in my group, who you see in the top right there, um, he's, a, uh, he's a graduate student in the group, has led this project. And he used um, the modern human Y chromosome to design a capture array that tiles across the Y chromosome really densely uh, and allows us then to use um, these probes as a bait to fish out the single copy non-recombining part of the Y chromosome of the Neanderthals. This is about seven megabases of sequence that we tile across. And using that, we were able to get um, Y chromosomal sequence for each of these individuals. And what you can see here is the coverage that we get per site. And you can see that for one of the Neanderthals, we actually have quite good coverage, around 15 fold. For another, we have around five fold coverage. And then we have lower coverage between one and, and three, four-fold coverage for the, for the Denisovans and the speed Neanderthal. Using these sequences, we then um, reconstructed the phylogeny of the Y chromosomes, what we were interested in. And what we see is that the Denisovan Y is an outgroup to the Y of um, the Neanderthals and the modern humans. In other words, the Y chromosome phylogeny looks exactly like the unusual mitochondrial phylogeny that we saw before. And so what we're suggesting then is that gene flow from the ancestors of modern humans into Neanderthals contributes the Y chromosome that's seen in later Neanderthals. And it also contributes the mitochondrial DNA that's seen in later Neanderthals. But this gene flow doesn't affect the Denisovans. So the Denisovans carry sort of the original archaic Y and mitochondrial types. Given the time constraints, this gene flow is very early. This must have taken some place sometime between 400,000 years ago and 100,000 years ago, so after SEMA and before the oldest Neanderthals that we have. It's also quite interesting to think about why such a replacement would occur. And our current best hypothesis is that it's because deleterious variants, because the Neanderthal populations were so small, um, Purifying selection to remove deleterious variants op operated very poorly, very badly, allowing deleterious variants to accumulate in the Neanderthals. And that kind of accumulation of deleterious variants might particularly affect the non recombining loci, such as the mitochondrial and the Y, such that when modern human, more fit mitochondrial and, and Y chromosomes are introduced, they replace the original Neanderthal and mitochondrial, uh, Neanderthal Y and mitochondrial sequences that have accumulated um, deleterious mutations. And we've done some simulations uh, to look at this, and it, it seems like it's at least a plausible scenario. So changing tack a little bit here, moving away from archaic human population history. With these genomes in hand, we're, one thing that we've been interested in is identifying genetic changes that have taken place on the human lineage in our recent history. And uh, we're interested in those because they might underlie some unique and interesting human phenotypes. In the past, this has been done by comparing the genomes of, of humans living today to the genomes of our living, closest living relative, the chimpanzee. But the common ancestor with chimpanzee is somewhere between six and seven million years ago. And so there are a lot of changes on this lineage, about 80 million human specific single nucleotide changes. Um, with the genomes of the Neanderthal and the Denisovan in hand, uh, who share a common ancestor much more recently with modern humans, 600, 700,000 years ago, we can divide this lineage and throw away a lot of these changes so that we really look at things that have arisen on the modern human lineage since our split from the Neanderthals and Denisovans, 
And when we look at those, this is a much more manageable number, a much smaller number, about 30,000 human specific changes genome wide, of which about 100 are fixed amino acid changes, non synonymous substitutions. And that set of non synonymous substitutions is the topic of um, the research in Santa Pepe's uh, functional group currently, where they're exploring the functions of the two variants, of the, uh, of the ancestral variant and the derived variant in cell, uh, organoid, and animal models. What my group has done over some years is to generate sort of a catalog of all these changes, so that we actually maintain a catalog of changes as, as we get more human, modern human variation data, as we get more Neanderthal and Denisovan variation data, we update this. And in a recent update, Christian Heider, who's a PhD student in the group, extended this to include all three high coverage Neanderthal genomes, the Denisovan, as well as the extensive human variation data that's now available. And then you put part of this resource, all the differences in and near coding sequences, into an online browser that's based on the exact browser framework. And this allows people who are not um, comfortable with using the, the VCF files that we produce to explore differences uh, between Neanderthals and modern humans in and near genes. And it provides also the nomad variation data in the back end, so you can look at human population frequencies of these ancestral and derived variants. We have this browser online. You can see the URL at the top. Um, it's not completely bug-free yet, but um, we continue to work on it. And just to sort of zoom in on some of the functions, so you can look at things like what's the state of any site um, in, the, in, the, in each of the Neanderthals or the Denisovan. You can look at the frequency of derived and ancestral alleles in the thousand genomes and the Simons Genome Diversity Project. And you can, um, of course, browse through to many other resources, such as DBSNP, um, our own genome browser, UCSE, ClinVar, all sorts of things. Another insight that came from the analysis of the very first Neanderthal genome was that there'd been gene flow from Neanderthals into the ancestors of modern humans. Now, this is a different gene flow to the one I was talking about before. The one I was talking about before is much older. This one um, is much more recent and it's in the other direction. So it's from Neanderthals into modern humans. And the initial evidence for this gene flow came from a simple allele sharing test uh, developed by Nick Patterson and David Reich. And Nick hypothesized that because Neanderthals are outgrouped to all modern humans, we expect that in the absence of gene flow, all modern humans living today, no matter where they live, should be equally closely related to the Neanderthals. But if gene flow had occurred, then some modern humans, particularly those who could have encountered the Neanderthals, in other words, the people who live today in um, Europe and Asia, might share more alleles with the Neanderthal than Africans do. And so this D statistic or ABBA-BABA test um, is very sometimes going to explain it briefly. And you see David and Nick here, who are um, the people who developed this. Um, this ABBA-BABA test takes two sister populations, in this case, two individuals from two human groups. And a third pot potentially admixing population, here the Neanderthals, and an outgroup, in this case, the chimpanzee. And at site with, sites where the Neanderthal differs from the chimpanzee, we simply count how often each of the modern human shares the Neanderthal allele. And under a model of no gene flow, we expect that the pattern other, where population two shares an allele with the Neanderthal, is just as frequent as other, where population one shares an allele with the Neanderthals. Um, and what we expect then is an equal count and an equal statistic and uh, zero, so no gene flow. And I have to say that was our prior going in. We didn't think that there would be gene flow between Neanderthals and modern humans, given at, at the point of having sequenced the first Neanderthal genome. However, if one of the populations deviates from this, if one shares more alleles with the Neanderthal, then the statistic will deviate from zero, will no longer be zero. And so we tested pairs of individuals from different populations. And what we found was that in all comparisons of a non-African to an African, the non-African individual had an excess of derived allele sharing with the Neanderthal. And interestingly, this was equally true for all populations outside Africa. It didn't matter if it was a European or an Asian or a Native American or a Papuan from Papua New Guinea. All, Afri all non-Africans um, shared more alleles with the Neanderthal. And no all non-Africans additionally had approximately the same amount of Neanderthal DNA. Interestingly, there was a paper just a few weeks ago from Josh Aikie's group showing that the amount of Neanderthal DNA in African genomes is in fact not zero. That statistic I just showed you uses the African, uh, Africans as a sort of ba baseline. 
but that migration from Europe, Europe into Africa following gene flow means that a subset of Neanderthal introgressed sequences in Europeans are also present in Africa. This means that we miss some of the Neanderthal ancestry in Europeans by using the African genomes as a null, but it doesn't invalidate the statistic. There is still more in Europeans than in Africans. So a simplified model that's consistent with the data is that when modern humans expand out of Africa, they met and mixed with their Neanderthals quite early on, perhaps somewhere in the Middle East, somewhere in the Levant. And then as the population spread out into Europe and Asia and even out into Oceania, into Melanesia, they carried their ne this Neanderthal ancestry with them. In addition, the ancestors of Melanesian groups, particularly the Papuans and Aboriginal Australians, appear to have mixed with the Denisovans, and they carry as much as three to four percent Denisovan DNA. Mainland Asians also carried a small fraction of Denisovan ancestry, about 0.2 percent, and that's from at least one distinct gene flow from Denisovans. So we think that there's actually multiple admixtures uh, with Denisovans. So introgress DNA from archaic humans acts a bit like a dye. It traces the encounters that modern humans have with the archaics, and then it traces their movements following following that encounter. And so understanding when and where and how many times admixture between archaic and modern humans took place, as well as the sources of, of this admixture, has been a very active field of research over the last years. And it seems that there's every few weeks a new paper out. It's clear that the history of admixture is, is very complex and that there was a lot of admixture between human groups. What I do think we know is that the majority, the major proportion of the Neanderthal DNA that we see in people outside Africa today is the result of a single or a result of an early admixture with, uh, the late Neanderthal with the late Neanderthal population. And it's likely, and, and it's shown, that there were additional mixtures with Neanderthals at other locations and at other times. But the extent to which this contributes to what we see today seems to be re relatively small. So the initial statistics that we calculated gave us an idea of how much Neanderthal DNA was present in the genomes of present day people around the world. But what it didn't do is give information about how that DNA is distributed. And so to tackle this question of how archaic ancestry is distributed in people living today, two groups, the group of Josh Akey and the group of David Reich, developed methods to make, um, for, for both the Neanderthal and later the Denisovan, um, to make maps of the intergressed sequences, providing us maps of pre the precise locations of segments of archaic DNA in many hundreds of, of, of human genomes. So what you see here are just two schematic represent representations of those two maps. And what you can see and what's immediately evident is that the Neanderthal DNA is not very evenly distributed. So you see, for, I'm just going to point on the on the Aki map. In red, you see the positions in red where Asian, pop, the Asian, where Asian individuals carry Neanderthal DNA. And in blue, you see where European individuals carry Neanderthal DNA. And what you can see is that there are some regions where there's really a lot of Neanderthal DNA. And there are other regions, say this region on chromosome 7 here, where there's very little, almost none. Um, and we think that that's an interesting signal. So the genomic regions where, Neane where Neanderthal DNA is less common seem to correspond quite closely to how functionally important those regions are. And so we see in regions of the genome that are under tighter constraint, so have that, that have um, more evolutionary constraint that are considered sort of more functional, um, there is less Neanderthal ancestry. So this is the Neanderthal ancestry proportion on the, on the y-axis. There's less Neanderthal ancestry than there is in regions of the genome that are under less, con less evolutionary constraint, that are more able to change. And this observation has been used to propose that purifying selection is acted to remove Neanderthal DNA from around genes or around other functional elements of the genome in modern humans. This implies that a substantial fraction of Neanderthal alleles were deleterious for modern humans. And it was used to support a proposal that there was possibly some level of hybrid incompatibility between Neanderthals and modern humans when, they're when they interbred. However, some very elegant theoretical work from um, Ivan Jurich and from Kelly Harris showed that it's not necessary to invoke incompatibilities. What they did is they modeled what we know about Neanderthal and modern human population history. So this is a, for a model moving forward in time. So here's the shared population of humans, modern humans and Neanderthals some point um, the Neanderthal population splits off. And um, what we know from the genomes of the Neanderthals is that they had a small effective population size over a rather long period of time before they then meet modern humans again. So this um, indicates the integration of this error. And so what happens in this small Neanderthal population 
is that slightly, deli slightly deleterious mutations are allowed to accumulate because they can't be selected out effectively by purifying selection. However, when Neanderthals mix with modern humans, these deleterious mutations come into a larger human population um, where selection operates more effectively. And so in modern human populations, these Neanderthal alleles are removed. And that what they also showed quite nicely, just based on theory, is that most of the removal of Neanderthal alleles takes place quite quickly in the first 10 to 20 generations. And after 20 generations, all individuals have around the same amount of Neanderthal ancestry. And the selection against the deleterious component, the Neanderthal deleterious alleles, becomes much less effective. It was sort of assumed that the selection against Neanderthal DNA in these functional regions corresponds primarily to the removal of Neanderthal DNA in coding sequences. However, Martin Peter in my group together with uh, Ben Van no, looked more closely at this, um, quantifying the amount of Neanderthal ancestry in different functional categories, um, different annotations, uh, bins of the genome, so to say. Um, and what he found was, so if we, in this plot, what we're looking at is Neanderthal ancestry proportion on the y-axis, and this black dotted line is the genome-wide average. So 2% is what we expect the average Neanderthal ancestry in a, in a region to be. And what you can see quite clearly is that protein coding genes are exactly on the genome-wide average. They don't appear to be depleted of Neanderthal ancestry at all. If we look at the most conserved protein coding sequences, then we do see a depletion. But as a, as a class, the entire group of protein coding genes, they don't seem to be depleted of Neanderthal ancestry. The class that is depleted of Neanderthal ancestry is um, pr promoters. So promoter regions show much less than Neanderthal ancestry than um, we would expect given the genome-wide average. And this indicates that the effect of selection against Neanderthal DNA is has been strongest in regulatory, regulatory regions. And it's a suggests that Neanderthals might have differed more from humans in their regulatory sequences than in their protein coding sequences. So despite this observation that there's been quite extensive selection against Neanderthal DNA, it clearly wasn't all bad. If we look in the genomes of Europeans and Asians, we find some places where many more individuals carry Neanderthal ancestry, or many individuals carry Neanderthal ancestry. And so we're looking at a piece of chromosome 9 here. We're looking at the mean Neanderthal ancestry in Europeans in red and in East Asians in green. And you can see that um, as ma ma many as 60% six, uh, of individuals in Europe carry Neanderthal alleles at this piece of chromosome 9, where it's almost absent in Asians. And um, similarly here we see um, a high proportion of, of East Asians carrying Neanderthal alleles in this region. Um, and there's some, some sort of small peak here in Europeans, but it's not as marked. At least some of these regions then are consistent with positive selection, so selection for Neanderthal DNA in modern humans. And so we started a project some years ago to identify archaic alleles that might have been advantageous for modern humans and to try and unravel mechanisms by which they might be acting. And here, Misha Dunneman, um, who was a postdoc in my group, scanned the genomes of around 1,500 present day people to identify introgressed alleles. Um, and then he determined the length of the haplotypes on which these candidate Neanderthal alleles sit. Um, and he looked in these two maps that I talked about earlier, the Veno map and the Reich Sankaraman map, um, to see that they fall in regions that have been um, previously predicted to have been introgressed from Neanderthals. And one of the regions that he, he pulled out was um, among the regions with the highest Neanderthal ancestry genome-wide. And it's 143 kilobases long. It's a block on chromosome 4. And it encompasses three members of the toll-like receptor family of genes. And we found this, this lock is particularly interesting because of its extended length and also because of the critical role that toll-like receptors play in innate immunity. The toll-like receptors are key, key proteins of the innate immune system and, and the innate immune system is sort of the initial response to uh, pathogenic invasion. These, these three toll-like receptors are cell surface receptors. There, there are other members of the family that are intracellular. And they act as a surveillance system for the cell. They recognize, recognize microbial surface proteins and lipopolysaccharides. They then, when they've detected them, elicit inflammatory responses, antimicrobial responses, and then eventually activate the adaptive immune response. As such, they're an absolute critical first line of defense against bacterial pathogens. And it had generally been thought that they would all be highly conserved. 
However, work done in the group of uh, Louise Quintana Mosi at the Institute Pasteur suggested that there has been positive selection in some human populations for the, this exact region, the region around toll-like receptors 1, 6, and 10. And so to look a little more closely at this, we extracted this 143 kilobase region that we now have shown comes from Neanderthals, from uh, 2,500 individuals. And we clustered those, those um, regions, those DNA sequences from those individuals um, into groups based on uh, their sequence distance to one another. And we put into groups uh, sequences that differ by fewer than one in a thousand nucleotides. This resulted in what we term seven core haplotypes. These are numbered here with the Roman numerals. We aligned the consensus sequences of these core haplotypes to the corresponding sequences of the genomes of Neanderthals, Nesivans, and uh, the outgroup, outgroups, chimpanzee and orangutan. And so what you see here is a neighbor joining tree of these seven haplotypes. So to walk you through this, the numbers that you see on the right of each of the pies are the number of chromosomes in which we see that haplotype. And the colors represent where in the world we see those haplotypes. And so what you can see, the most common haplotype is haplotype 5. It's seen in 3,800 of the chromosomes in our set, and it's seen in all populations worldwide. However, what was interesting was that there are three toll-like receptor haplotypes in modern humans that are more similar to either the Neanderthal or the Denisovan genomes than they are to any of the other modern human sequences. Haplotype uh, number, number three is actually quite common. It's seen in around 900 chromosomes, and um, it's more similar to the Neanderthal genome than it is to any other genome. Sorry. Um, there's a second Neanderthal-like haplotype, which is very similar to the Neanderthal reference sequence, um, which is seen in 61 chromosomes. And there's a rather rare haplotype seen in two South Asian individuals, so two chromosomes from two different individuals, which is similar to the Denisovan sequence. If we look at this sort of on the map, where we just look at uh, non-archaic haplotypes in blue and the two different Neanderthal-like haplotypes in yellow and in green, what we see is that the yellow haplotypes <clears throat> are spread across the entire world, so from, from, uh, from the, the Americas through Europe and Asia, but not in Africa, whereas the second Neanderthal haplotype in green is only seen in Asians. And this is consistent with conclusions from a, a few papers that suggested that there was a distinct pulse of Neanderthal admixture into the ancestors of present-day Asians. We would propose perhaps introducing the second toll-like receptor um, haplotype. There are also um, population allele frequency differences within modern humans for these toll-like receptor haplotypes, suggesting that there might have been population-specific selection on these toll-like receptor haplotypes in different human groups, possibly at different times. So to try and understand whether these introgressed haplotypes might have a functional effect, we looked at the sequences of the associated archaic-like haplotypes. And the, so we had these 61 archaic like SNPs. And what we asked was, do any of these SNPs change the protein coding sequence of any of the toll like receptor proteins? And the answer was no. So we have no protein coding differences introduced by these Neanderthal haplotypes. However, what we did see was that there were a number of uh, archaic variants, an enrichment of archaic variants within known transcription factor binding motifs, suggesting that if there's an effect, it might be regulatory. And we were fortunate enough to have expression data um, RNA sequence, sequencing data from lymphoblastoid cell lines from the same individuals which we'd used um, to, to um, analyze the, the genomes here. And so we asked whether the individuals that carry the Neanderthal-like alleles, Neanderthal toll-like receptor haplotypes, differ in their expression of the toll-like receptor genes from individuals that carry modern human haplotypes. And fascinatingly, in lymphoblastoid cell lines, and I'm showing here each the expression of each of the genes, um, we see that all, the, all three of the toll-like receptor genes show significantly higher expression in individuals that carry archaic-like alleles um, than those that, that do not. So what you see here on the, on the left-hand side of each plot is individuals that carry two copies of the archaic allele, so homozygous for the Neanderthal allele, in the middle heterozygotes, and on the right, individuals that carry just modern human toll-like receptors. And you can see it's um, a, a gradation with the individuals that carry the two copies of the Neanderthal-like toll-like receptors having the highest expression. Heterozygotes are intermediate and homozygotes for the modern human allele um, are the lowest. Of course, these 
SNPs all share on a sit, shared, uh, sit on a shared haplotype. So these expression differences in each of the genes are not independent observations. We then looked at a broader set of tissues from the GTEx project to see whether this is a tissue specific effect. And indeed it was, sorry, indeed it was. It's only seen in lympho, lymphoblastoid cell lines and lymphocytes. It's not seen in any of the other tissues in GTEx. Of course, we have then a molecular phenotype. We seem to see that there's a change in expression in, induced by these um, introgressed Neanderthal toll-like receptor haplotypes. But we were also curious whether there might be an effect on the organism phenotype. And to do this, what we did is look at the public genome-wide association study data from humans. And these are studies that link genetic variants to phenotypes in large cohorts. And what we found is that there are 79 SNPs with significant associations in this 143 kilobase region defined by our introgressed toll-like receptor haplotype, of which 13 are introgressed archaic-like SNPs. And these archaic-like SNPs showed significant associations in just two studies. The first is a study of a very large study of common allergies carried out by 23andMe that looked for associations to things, uh, looked for genetic associations with things like uh, common allergies, like um, allergies to dust, pollen, uh, pet fur. And a second study, and you can see this is this region is the, the strongest uh, association in that study. So this is the region um, around the toll-like receptor haplotype. Um, and this region, 12 of the archaic-like SNPs are significantly associated. And a second study that assessed antigens against Helicobacter pylori, a common infectious bacteria that causes gastritis and stomach ulcers, um, and looking at resistance to Helicobacter pylori. And what you can see here, this is the same region again, that um, 13 of the archaic-like SNPs show uh, a significant association with um, with this phenotype. And interestingly, the direction goes that the archaic, the archaic alleles are consistently associated with a reduced susceptibility to Helicobacter pylori infection and an increased susceptibility to allergic disease. And so at this point, we uh, speculate quite wildly that the increased expression of the introgressed alleles, of the, of the increased expression of the, the genes caused by the introgressed alleles um, may enhance innate immune surveillance. It may enhance the expression of, of these toll-like receptor genes, um, therefore increasing reactivity against pathogens, and in this case, not necessarily Helicobacter pylori, um, but that's what we have in the GWAS study as a sort of a proxy for, for, for um, pathogen surveillance. Um, but the, the trade-off for this is an increased, sens increased sensitivity to non-pathogenic allergens, resulting in allergic diseases in present-day people. Most of the initial studies that look at the impact of Neanderthal alleles on modern human phenotypes sort of inferred this impact from the function of the genes that the introgressed sequences were in or near, or by doing what we did, looking at molecular phenotypes, such as changes in gene expression. But a more direct way to understand the impact of introgression is to look for an association between the introgressed DNA and a phenotype of interest. And until recently, this was very difficult to do because there were really a limited number of individuals for whom both genotype data and detailed information about multiple phenotypes was available. The first study of this sort was carried out in 2016 by uh, Tony Capra's group, who took advantage of um, a large consortium called the Emerge Network that was compiling um, health re ele electronic health records, which they reduced to, um, they mined those electronic health records and reduced that to a set of 46 traits that they, were, that they could um, assess. And they had genotyping, uh, genotyping data for 28,000 of those individuals. What they then did was use that genotype typing data to identify Neanderthal alleles and then carry out an association study with uh, disease phenotypes that were um, present in the, in the medical records. And they showed that Neanderthal alleles explain a significant fraction of the variation in risk for depression, for example, and also for skin lesions um, resulting from sun exposure. At around the same time, the pilot release of the UK Biobank, which I'm sure many people have by now heard of, um, became available. This is a, an amazing resource that's collecting and making available genotype data together with extensive phenotypes for around 500,000 British individuals. And during the, using the pilot release, uh, we were able to evaluate for the first time the contribution of Neanderthal introgressed alleles to common so non-disease traits. And this is work done by, again, by Mitya Dunneman, who began by controlling for, for the participant set. So we started with the pilot, pilot data, which is 150,000 individuals. We controlled for ancestry and relatedness um, using both self-reporting, but also a PCA indicating um, 
substantial non-European ancestry and, and individuals that just don't cluster very tightly with, with the other um, individuals in the panel. This trimmed the data set, so we threw away 40,000, 45,000 individuals. Um, trimmed the data set down to 115,000 participants. And then from the 800,000 SNPs that were genotyped using the Affymetrix Axiom Array, we um, identified first the introgressed Neanderthal variants present in each individual. So we scanned through the set of um, genotyped sites, identifying sites where the individual where each individual carried Neanderthal introgressed alleles. Um, and then we, we looked at alleles that match the Neanderthal uh, genome and differ from African genomes, and then checked that they fall into regions where there's strong previous evidence that um, there's Neanderthal introgressed and, and Neanderthal introgressed haplotype. And then because Neanderthal DNA, uh, introgressed DNA, occurs in blocks, right, we have these haplotype blocks, we cluster the variants that are in linkage with another, one another, and we choose a tag SNP for each of the haplotype blocks. And this gives us, gave us um, 6,000 6, uh, archaic tag SNPs and then a matched set of um, non-archaic tag SNPs. And we test for associations then between the presence of a Neanderthal tag SNP and each of the 136 baseline phenotypes that we have. And these are phenotypes that, that tell us about things like height and weight, um, diet, uh, behavior, sleeping patterns, and so on. And we identified then 15 associations of Neanderthal alleles with 11 distinct phenotypes. These include um, pheno uh, phenotypes like sleep behavior, blood pressure, muscle and uh, body fat proportions, and body size traits. However, more than half of the associations that we find involve the integumentary system, so aspects of skin and hair traits. And particularly pigmentation seem to come out of this um, analysis. And we know that changes in pigmentation of the skin and hair is one of the most obvious perceptible differences between human groups. Pigmentation traits likely resolve, evolve quite quickly in response to differences in sunlight at different latitudes. Darker pigmentations are protective against UV damage, while lighter pigmentation facilitates vitamin D synthesis at higher latitudes. Um, pigmentation is also likely a very strong target of sexual selection. And interestingly, we know very little about the skin and hair pigmentation of Neanderthals. Among the strongest associations that we found for Neanderthals in the UK Biobank are two distinct regions. So we have two Neanderthal haplotypes near a gene called basonuclein 2, BNC2. And Neanderthal variants in BNC2 are among the highest frequency Neanderthal variants in modern Europeans, although they're com almost completely absent in Asian populations. And so there's very good evidence for recent positive selection on these variants in Europeans. BNC2 as a gene has been associated with pigmentation traits like freckling, but in previous studies, the precise impact of the Neanderthal variants couldn't be determined. Um, it, didn't, it didn't seem that the Neanderthal haplotype acted as an EQTL in any gene expression studies. But using the biobank, we can now show directly that individuals that carry Neanderthal alleles in this region show increases incidences of sunburning, sunburn, poor tanning, um, and also an increased risk for the same keratotic skin lesions caused by sun exposure as seen in the previous Simonti et al. study from Tony Capra's group. This is then typical, um, this is then, these traits are then typical of people with fairer skin, suggesting that this Neanderthal um, haplotype might have a role in, in fair skin. Fascinating, there's a second association in, this, in the region near BNC, not to, not, in the region near BNC2. It's a separate introgressed haplotype. It's also at quite appreciable frequency in Europeans, almost 20%. And here, carriers of the Neanderthal, um, the Neanderthal haplotype have more olive tone skin than people without introgression in this region. And this indicates that there are possibly, first of all, possibly multiple alleles in and near BNC2 that contribute to pigmentation in modern humans. And some of them are contributed by Neanderthals. The apparent variation in the phenotypic effect of two Neanderthal, two Neanderthal haplotypes quite near to one another, um, I think put paid to my, my idea that we could perhaps use introgressed phenot phenotype associations in modern humans to try and learn something about the Neanderthal phenotypes. So here we would draw opposite conclusions about the Neanderthal um, phenotype based on these two haplotypes. So just this, this, this variation in the phenotypic effects in this cohort indicates a difficulty with drawing simple conclusions about Neanderthal phenotypes from association studies of introgressed alleles. 
I still think this is an interesting potential um, direction of research. And so as I bring this to a close, I've shown you some examples of how Neanderthal introgress DNA influ influences traits in present day people. There's a growing list of Neanderthal alleles that have been adapted for modern humans. Interestingly, many of them involve defense against pathogens, um, pigmentation, um, and linked, are linked to environmental adaptation. And it's perhaps not surprising that some archaic alleles then might have been adaptive for modern humans arriving in Eurasia. Um, integration could have provided the opportunity for modern humans moving into these new environments to acquire alleles from the archaic humans who'd lived there for an extended period of time, many hundreds of thousands of years, and who were presumably quite well adapted to the local environments, foods, climates, pathogens. Um, any other form of adaptation is slow. Um, adaptation typically proceeds with either new mutations where fa a, a favorable allele has to arise and it can then easily be lost, or it happens on standing variation in the population, which requires that such variation exists. And the modern human population coming into Eurasia sort of 70,000 years ago had already been through a bottleneck that reduced variation. By contrast, favorable alleles that have emerged in the Neanderthals can spread rapidly by, could, could spread potentially rapidly by gene flow into modern humans. And so perhaps modern humans obtained for free, um, sort of at, at a low cost, at a frequency of a few percent, these advantageous alleles, thus ensuring that they, they, they wouldn't be lost immediately and could be acted on by positive selection. So I hope I've convinced you that sequencing archaic genomes is not just a curiosity, that it provides us with a rich resource to begin understanding not only the archaic humans themselves, but also modern human population history and adaptation. The patterns of Neanderthal ancestry tell us about how admixture happened and how it shaped human diversity. Um, Introgress Neanderthal DNA that's been under selection points us at traits and selective process that have been important in recent modern human evolution. And then linking archaic introgress DNA to phenotypic traits allows us to begin to unravel the genetic architecture of these traits and maybe tells us something about differences between Neanderthals and modern humans. For this, um, these many new biobanks that are emerging of an incredibly important resource um, and even uh, something I really want to underline is the importance of uh, detailed and extensive phenotyping information being included in these resources. So I'm going to end by just thanking very many wonderful colleagues and collaborators. This is of course work done by many people. I tried to acknowledge each of them as we went along. Um, the work has all been done under the guidance of Svante Pebo in the Department of um, evolutionary genetics at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology um, and the Ancient Genomes and Bioinformatics group at the uh, MPI EFRR, my favorite people to work with. And thank you for your time.